All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I am the founder of Humanist Learning Systems, which is one of the uh, so, uh, which is helps sponsor this series. I'm also the vice president of the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association, and I want to welcome you to the Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn um, and my co host Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Castillo at Arizona State University. I teach organizational leadership, and I am the secretary of the International Humanistic Management Association US chapter. We're so happy to have you here today. Thank you. Our guest today is Joe Sprangle. He's an associate professor and holds the H. Gordon and Mary Beth Reed Smith chair of the Business Administration at Mary Baldwin University. He is also the founder and principal consultant of Emanuel Strategic Sustainability. He combines nearly 30 years of manufacturing experience and 15 years of work as an academic to guide his current work on developing and applying a humanistic manufacturing framework. Joe, I am so thrilled you, just, you agreed to join us because I don't think there's a lot of conversation about humanistic management in manufacturing spaces. So we're very excited to hear what you have to say. All righty, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, let me share my screen. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Jennifer and Elizabeth, for co hosting this. I guess we're renaming it Nosh and Learn, right? So um, um, I'm excited to share my work that's evolved uh, around what I'm calling uh, humanist manufacturing. Um, so as I was working through my career in manufacturing, I kind of felt like this poor little hamster. I went in day after day, worked and worked and worked. I only left at night because I was too tired to do anything more. It was not that I ever had finished everything we needed to do. There was always new fires to put out and new issues to resolve. And so I, I often joke with people that I had a midlife crisis and decided I needed to do something different. Uh, the reality was it wasn't a crisis, but, you know, it just felt like there had to be something that was better for me to do out there. And so the more I looked at it, I'd always felt a call to teach. And so I decided that uh, my next phase was going to be as a university professor. So I went back on my doctorate and did all those sorts of things that help you to transition from industry to that particular profession. So while I was doing this work, um, I was introduced to Ray Anderson, who is the CEO and founder of a company called Interface. And if you see carpet tiles in a, in a commercial space, that's the sort of thing that he introduced to the United States that he brought over to the from uh, Europe. And uh, at one point he was asked by a salesperson, hey, we have people that are wanting to know in California what we're doing about sustainability. And his first thought was, we're not doing anything. We comply with regulatory requirements. We're doing what we're supposed to do. You know, what else should we do? But somehow a book called The Ecology of Commerce from Paul Hawken ended up on his desk. And as he started to read through it, he said that he had this spear in the moment chest, or spear in the chest moment where he described himself as an avowed plunderer of the world's resources. And it was like, wow, you know, this is pretty, pretty amazing. And so as I was going through my own sorts of thoughts about how do I move forward with my teaching career, this sustainability thing kind of resonated with me. And the fact that he was doing it in 1995 was really incredible because that wasn't when that sort of thing was happening, uh, a very limited opportunity for uh, people be, to be doing that sort of thing. And so ultimately, he became one of my heroes. I have very few heroes, and, and typically they're, they're going to be somebody of this sort of caliber that um, I'm not quite into fashion people or, or uh, celebrities and that sort of thing. So, so the next thing I started to do is just to immerse myself in gaining more knowledge about sustainability and what it meant. And so throughout my doctorate, the various assignments I was given, the the things that I would do as projects in my dissertation all evolved around doing something sustainability focused. When I graduated from there, I went to Ithaca College for three years and it was kind of cool because I got to move into a LEED, Platinum LEED certified school um, 
And so, you know, living and learning and teaching in that particular environment was pretty fascinating. I then moved to uh, Mary Baldwin University. Then it was a college then. Um, and uh, they had just integrated sustainability throughout their entire curriculum. So that was a really st strong appeal for me. And then for the last five and a half years, I was a, a dean of our College of Business Professional Studies, primarily because no one else fit the, fit the role, but uh, I felt obligated to do it. But as of December of this past year, I stepped out of that role and I've been on this wonderful thing called a sabbatical for the last five months. Um, I think everybody should have one of those where you get to do what you want for, for several months. So, um, and I'll return to, well, and then I joke that now I'm having a two thirds life crisis, right? I got to figure out what do I want to do with the, the last chapter of my career, so to speak. And so what came out of that was I'm going to return to teaching. I'm ramping up a consulting company that will help manufacturing operations become humanist. And, um, and then out of that, I decided to, to write a book that kind of lays out my thoughts on that particular topic of what at that time I was calling responsible manufacturing. So as I was doing that, one of the things that came forward for me was um, learning about Bob Chapman, who was the chairman and CEO of Barry Miller. And one of the things that he found was that he had been taught to do business one way, but as he started to question that, he realized that actually putting employees first and, and you know, extraordinary power of caring as he wrote about in his book, Everybody Matters, that, that concept really resonated with me because I've seen so often how we have treated employees poorly, right? In some cases, it's almost like they're an afterthought or a disposable asset when, um, you know, you always see that, well, you know, our, our employees are our greatest asset, but then they treat him uh, very much differently than that. And so, you know, that, that theory that the customer was always right sort of concept, I didn't agree with that because often the customer is completely wrong, especially when they do something that ends up throwing one of your employees under the bus, so to speak. And so as I saw that strong focus, it was like, yes, you know, this, this truly is important. And you know, this truly human leadership approach that he proposes and subscribes to and has had tremendous success ended up being something that I felt was really important to integrate into what I was doing. The more I researched the word human, then I came across these humanist commitments. And what I found is these particular 10 from the humanistcommitments.org uh, website. And the, the thing that kind of I really like was that these are all things that I was learning and subscribing to as a person that was working on doing things from a sustainable focus. And they all made a lot of sense, right? That these are important. And if they were important to Karvaka, Confucius, Guatama, and Socrates, you know, the, these philosophers of, of the past, they should be something that I consider as well. And so I then dug deeper and I found Jennifer's work and uh, started to build that into to my thought process about how do I how do I move this sort of work forward. And the only problem I had with all of this is that I'm a practicing Christian and that, you know, there's no supernatural or theism part of it. But I thought, hey, this all still makes sense to me. So I, why not move it forward? And I don't think there's really a problem with that. For one, we don't spend a lot of time talking about our faith at, at work. So we can still implement all of these and, and things are just fine. What I found is just a few examples of, for example, those that put altruism first. Um, they outperform their competition when this is built into their DNA. There are several examples of uh, one company that that ended up getting a lot of masks early in the pandemic and they didn't need them all. So they went about figuring out what can they do to get them to others. They didn't worry about, oh, should I mark up the price? Should I do whatever? They just wanted to make sure other people were able to, to gain access to these. Uh, Brene Brown, you know, she's one of those that's had millions of people look at her um, uh, work on um, empathy. And to me, that's so, important in what we're going through as a world these days. There, there's so much division, there's so much injustice, uh, unjust actions that are happening to people. And the more we can do to be empathetic as a leader, 
you know, there, there's a fine line. You can be too empathetic or you, you know, but I, I've found that in my case, by doing this well, it really does uh, make for in a workplace where people are very engaged and they, they are very committed to helping you as a leader to move uh, initiatives forward. And so, you know, the other thing is I grew up on a farm out in the middle of nowhere and global awareness wasn't, I mean, my awareness was like a 15 mile radius from my, my home. And, you know, the, the more that I've learned as I've been out in the world uh, and seen different things, um, you know, how, how can we continue to move forward with all this inequity that people are experiencing, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we have this enormous wealth inequality that, that's happening where the, the one percenters are getting richer and richer all the time while we end up with more and more people that are living lives of poverty and so forth. In the U.S., we actually imprison more people than any other country in the world, even countries like China and Russia, uh, which seems to be a sad commentary. And things like water issues are becoming, scarcity is becoming more and more of a problem. And another is there just seems to be a dearth of humility in the world. Um, it seems like everybody's out trying to trump themselves up as the latest and greatest. And, you know, we really need more people that, that ascribe to that belief like Patagonia. They actually screen their employees for a, a level of humility. If the, if the applicants aren't humble in nature, they're not going to hire them sort of thing. And so I believe, you know, we also have a responsibility to do more. The more we know, the more it's uh, our um, need to, to do something that's different. And I have lots of thoughts on all the others, but uh, if people are interested, they can Go to my website and read my blog on those topics and and uh, soon to be book that's coming out as well. So, so one of the things I did was I practiced what I preach about the importance of uh, vision to guide my work and um, to, to, to develop this book. And so the more I studied the manufacturing exemplars like Anderson, like Chapman, like uh, uh, Chenard from Patagonia and so many others, I saw that all of these companies were having tremendous success and in, in, uh, increased profitability by doing the right things from a social and environmental aspect. And it was like, so why aren't more people doing this? Why aren't more people integrating these sorts of humanist principles into their organizations? And, you know, part of what I also could see was that you can then help others to, to build better lives by being part of the manufacturing community. I mean, for example, I went to work in a manufacturing operation. I didn't go to college uh, initially. Eventually I did go, but then I had tuition reimbursement. And so they were able to pay my way th all the way through a doctorate practically. And, um, and you know, people that are not in a, in a good position can go to work in a manufacturing environment. They can make a good wage, they can get their education, and then they can go off and maybe do something else or stay in that particular industry. It's a great industry with lots of potential. And so I just saw this as a, a, a way that if people knew more about it, it would be an opportunity for them to reach higher levels of potential. And so as academics, we gotta define things, right? So um, when I was looking at it, you know, you can see these three elements that I that I came up with in it. And employees really are an important focus in what I'm doing, but it's not just them, it's all internal and external stakeholders. So it it is people, all of the people that work in each level of the company, but it's also the people that you impact on the outside. It could be your suppliers, it can be the government, it can be a uh, community organization and so on and so forth. And so I found it was really important for me that we take care of all stakeholders, not just shareholders. They're important as well. But the more we do to lift up everyone, the better off we're going to be. And again, there's that theme that when companies do this, they actually are more profitable. It just keeps recurring as a, as a theme throughout all this. And then there's really a strong emphasis on building it from a positive strengths based approach. Uh, I've been in too many environments where there's this downward spiral of negativity and it just seems like problems grow in that particular environment where when I've actually implemented the strengths-based and positive, it just 
it, it's an upward spiral that, that really uh, creates tremendous potential in the organization. And then ultimately, it has to be a full, a whole system approach that, that benefits everybody from the people, the planet, and the profitability. The, the, you know, to me, that, that is all important. We need a profit, but we don't need a profit just to get richer. We need profit to be able to then do more, to be able to help more people and lift up everyone sort of thing. So, um, so ultimately, it led to me developing this, what I'm calling a humanist manufacturing framework. And so the foundation of it is these humanist commitments, right? We need to develop an opportunity where uh, in this um, Humanist Manifesto 2000 that I came across, we were looking at, you know, we need to figure out commitments that people, all, everyone that's a citizen around the world is treated with dignity and worth, that we mitigate human suffering, that we give respect and concern for everyone, and that ultimately we all try to increase the level of human happiness that's out there. And so if people don't subscribe to this uh, level, then it's going to be hard to, to put together the balance of the items in the framework. Um, and then, you know, I again, I mentioned Jennifer's book. I, I really liked her rules that, that she came up with where we're not supposed to do any evil. We need to respect people. Reality matters. And we need to embrace our responsibility to do, to do something to make the world a better place. Um, the next phase is actually leadership development. And when you think about it, if we were taught to do certain things and we've done those things for a long period of time, we think they're the right things. Maybe they're not. And so as leaders, I've, I would then ask them to go out and do kind of an assessment. Where do they land on? How do they integrate humanist commitments into their organization currently? And what is the makeup of the team? You know are they all like themselves and they think and act and do everything the same way or is there balance across the, the team um, often you're going to find that it's the, the first thing and not the latter uh, what are they doing also to to make sure that everyone is taken care of and move away from that profit first mentality to moving towards some of these other principles and i'm a really strong proponent of personality assessments in part you know, when, I, when I've done Clifton, Strengths, and some of these others, the strengths that they came back with, they didn't really surprise me. But what I gained the most benefit from was the things that were hidden from me. I, I didn't know that these things were, uh, I had blind spots, right? And we all have them. And the reason they're called blind spots is because we don't know what they are until we've used some sort of tool to help us figure them out. And then by developing this entire leadership team to be cohesive, to have the balance we need at all levels um, uh, or all disciplines across the organization, the better off we're going to be. The next thing is to then go in and create internal operations that allow us to produce products or put services in place that are going to be ethical, right? Uh, you know, that we're going to use design that utilizes cradle to cradle concepts or that we don't use harmful or hazardous chemicals uh, or other materials in the processes that we do. We practice things like biomimicry where we look at how nature does things, which is incredibly fascinating and see what we can do to adopt them into our organizations. Um, and then also plants, for example, should be using renewable energies. They should be looking at ways to reduce the waste that goes into landfills, for example, try to get to a point where there's zero waste if possible. And, and in some cases, organizations are now becoming regenerative where they're, uh, or they're giving back to the environment sort of thing. And so all of those aspects to me are, you know, things that have to be built in if you're going to have a humanist manufacturing operation. And then all of these set the stage for employees being able to do their work really well and to do it with the most amount of positive and social and environmental impact. And, you know, I, my strong belief is that if we take care of making sure that the employees are in a position to do their work in the best possible manner, everything else takes care of itself. The customers are taken care of, the suppliers are taken care of, all the other stakeholders that are part of the organization end up being taken care of because we have this commitment to our employees first, 
and then uh, we make sure that everyone else, they make sure that everyone else is taken care of. We can only as leaders do so much, but if everyone in our organization is integrating these humanist principles into the work they do, look how much better things are gonna be. And the thing I love right now is that younger generations, they aren't asking for us to have values that match their values, they demand it. If you don't have these sorts of values, you're not gonna be able to attain, uh, attract and retain really good quality employees as we move forward. The, the next phase is in, we can do a lot of great things internally, but what can we also do externally? In a lot of cases, the stuff that I talk about, it not only benefits the external community, but it also benefits you internally. For example, there's a huge uh, employment gap in the manufacturing sector. And, well, there's one in every sector right now with a great resignation, right? And so I'm encouraging and, and showing examples of how people are hiring those that are on the autism spectrum. They're, they're doing things with what some call returning citizens that are formerly um, incarcerated individuals. Um, you know, doing more to integrate more women in the manufacturing environment. Historically, they've been at lower levels or quality departments and so forth. We need more of them in uh, management and leadership roles across the organization. Some group that I call handy capable because, you know, they've, they've been called handicapped, but they really bring a lot of wonderful things to, to the manufacturing environment. And in some cases, they just need very simple accommodations but they end up being very loyal employees because other organizations aren't willing to hire them for whatever reasons. Um, and part of it is we also need to, to pay a living wage so that uh, with the right kind of benefits so that our employees can be contributing members of their communities. And that might be volunteer activities, that might be whatever, but they're also uh, purchasing uh, product uh, and creating a stronger economic impact in the organization, uh, in the communities in which they they belong. And I put the strategy planning and change processes at the back of the book because I feel like you need to learn all about all these other things before then you can begin to start to actually do the strategy and figure out what is our why as an organization? What is really important to us? What is it that our vision is as we move forward? And what's our mission? And what are the values that we subscribe to as an organization? Once all that's done, then you need to go through the process of developing the tactical plans to, to make all the strategic objectives come to fruition. And then the change process itself is very extensive and um, takes a lot of work from a communication perspective, understanding employees, understanding the phases that they need to go through as they they mourn the loss of what was and, and learn and, and that imp that difficult time when transition is occurring and they don't know exactly how it's gonna impact them to ultimately then getting to a point where people do buy in. And in some cases people won't buy in, but what do we gotta do then to, to, to create a, a, a just separation if that's the ultimate thing that needs to happen. So as I go through all of this, you know, I've, I've very briefly re reviewed what's 16 chapters in a book right now. And so I'm confident that those that do utilize the various aspects of what I've laid out in this framework will have the opportunity to realize the sorts of benefits that you see on this slide. You know, we need strong, great employees. We need to do a better job of, of lifting up our stakeholders. Ultimately, we're gonna delight our customers and, and so forth. And so, you know, I'm really grateful for being allowed to share my thoughts on this topic with all of you. And um, I've shared this slide deck with uh, Jennifer, who will then share it later with uh, those that have uh, signed on and, and uh, or have expressed interest in that. So, uh, Joe, do you have any final thoughts before we um, end the session? My final thought is there's so much evidence to the fact that doing things from a humanist perspective is the right way to do it from a financial perspective as well. So why not do it? Everybody should be doing it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been the International Humanistic Management Association's Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn. And uh, we'll begin again in the fall and we'll see you there. All right. Thank you.